Thank you, Sandy. Good morning. Before we begin, I found something on the internet I would like to share with you. Happy Palm uh -huh. Sunday. <laughs> we celebrate Palm Sunday today. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, a great crowd took palm branches and went out to meet Jesus. Then they shouted, Hosanna, bless on the name who comes in the name of the Lord, blessing on the King of Israel. The scripture that Sandy just read for us takes place right before this triumphal entrance to Jerusalem. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And Mary took an extraordinary amount of very expensive perfume and anointed Jesus' feet. John's gospel is divided neatly into two parts. The book of Signs, chapter 2 to 12, and the book of Glory, the rest of the chapter. Chapter 2 to 12 includes a series of seven miraculous signs. Signs are things that point beyond the power and the presence of God. And these signs point to God and can be properly understood only when seen through the eyes of faith. The resurrection of Lazarus, which happened right before chapter 11, is the last and the greatest sign. The second part of John's Gospel is the Book of Glory, chapter 13 to 20, which records Jesus' glorification through his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus, as the King of Israel, is a central to the Passion Story and Gospel of John. And today's text comes towards the end of the Book of Signs, right before the triumph entrance to Jerusalem, and it serves as a transition into the Book of Glory. All four Gospels present an account of Jesus being anointed by woman with a costly jar of perfume. So I, I put a lot of time making a table for you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark and Matthew tell a similar story. It takes place two days before Passover in the town of Bethany at Simon the leper's home. An unnamed woman anointed, anoints Jesus' head with expensive perfume. The disciples react angrily because of the woman's wasteful, lavish act, complaining that it could have been sold for more than a year's wages. But Jesus receives the woman's gift as a selfish act of love and devotion. He said, he, she has done a beautiful thing to me, preparing his body for the burial and the woman's act of love will forever be remembered wherever the good news is preached. And Luke tells a little different story, somewhat different. A sinful woman pours perfume not on Jesus' head, but on his feet. And it happened a year, about, about a year before his death in Simon the Pharisee's house. As a host, Simon the Pharisee had arrogantly neglected to extend the customary respect and hospitality to Jesus, his guest. But this sinful woman anoints Jesus' feet, lavishing her love and gratefulness upon Jesus. And this time, Jesus was criticized for allow, allowing a sinner to touch him. 
And after com commenting on her hospitality and contrast to that of the host, Jesus pronounces her sins forgiven. And today's story, John's story, combines the elements of these two traditions, but placed in a different context and setting. First, the woman who anoints Jesus in the story is neither unnamed nor a sinner. She is Mary, the sister of Martha, whose brother Lazarus, Jesus has just raised from the dead in the previous chapter. Mary anoints Jesus with high-priced perfume at the dinner, and Judas is named as a disciple who objects to the waste. And Mary anoints again, points to the Christ identity as Messiah King, and also points to his humble position as a servant king. When Mary anoints Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair, she foreshadows Jesus' action at the coming of Last Supper when Jesus washed the disciples' feet and teach them to how to love one another through sacrificial, humble service. We had um, our hospitality team retreat last month, and we were divided into three groups. Betty, one of our co-chair of the hospitality team, led the group in making the cookie, cookies in jar, and we talked about the practical way to provide hospitality. Kara, she's right there. <laughs> uh, the other co-chair of our first time guest hospitality team led a group discussion on how we can effectively follow up with our first time guests. And I also led a group to discuss on how we can care for our congregation. And we had a great time, discuss, great discussions and come up with lots of ideas. The cookies in a jar are our gifts for our first time guests. And we talked about how we can send notes to people who are going you know, difficult times and greeter, how greeters can take the families who are here for the first time to the Sunday school wing because it's kind of far away from our front door. Um, and we need more signs to let people know about the bathroom which is kind of hid in the back. So these are more important parts of hospitality for our church. But today, in from today's scripture, uh, made me think of an essential parts of hospitality that never occurred to me before. And that is vulnerability. One reason the hospitality can be challenging is that there is always risk of rejection. When we open ourselves to welcome others, when we send out an invitation to come, start a conversation with someone you know you met for the first time, or give gifts, reaching out for a handshake or give a hug, there is always a risk of rejection or criticism. Anytime we face rejection, it hurts. It may feel like a personal attack. The woman in the Gospels, all four Gospels, were criticized for her loving action. And the woman in the Luke was condemned for her identity as a sinner. But hospitality isn't only about us. Hospitality should be an opportunity for everyone to grow in the community. It is a chance for our guests to experience warmth and welcome. It is a chance for us to discipline ourselves. It is an opportunity for us to develop deeper relationship with others and with God. To face this risk of rejection and criticism, we have to become vulnerable. 
we witness radical hospitality in today's scripture. In a way, these three siblings represent hospitality expressed by being their authentic selves. Lazarus and his sister hosted dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who joined him at the table. Martha provides literal material service. She serves without any complaints. Martha shows her hospitality by doing what she does best, serving. And for Lazarus is a living testimony of a Christ influence. Jesus' great, greatest sign Raising Lazarus from the dead made many Jews believe in him, and the chief priests and Pharisees felt threatened by Jesus, setting his betrayal and death in motion. Lazarus also became a target as the authority plot to remove the evidence of Jesus' miraculous power. As Mary anoints Jesus' feet, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. According to our book, Meet Jesus in the Table, Gail O'Day writes that Mary's extravagant act replaced the stench of death that once lingered over this household with the fragrance of love and devotion. Another thing that caught my eyes in the text is how Jesus naturally accepts and receives this radical hospitality. Imagine you yourself receiving this radical hospitality. Do you think you can receive them well? One of the cultural difference between Korea, South Korea, and Western culture is how pe people receive gifts or offers. In South Korean culture, Modestly declining a gift or refusing an offer once or twice or three times before really accepting it seem as a sign of humility and respect. So it is something like this. It's a very hot day and you want to offer this Korean a, a cup of water. And you offer, hey, this here's some water. Then she or he will, I'm fine, thank you, I'm fine. Then you have to keep asking two or three more times. Here's water, drink, it's very hot. And he or she will, oh, I'm okay, thank you, I'm okay. And for the last time, you have to offer again. Here, some drink, have some water. And this person will insist reluctantly, and which is considered good manners, and receive that water. So they're trying to be polite, which is a difference in cultures. And by the way, I don't do that anymore, so feel free to <laughs> give gifts. Uh, I can re receive them gratefully at once. <laughs> so receiving well and gratefully makes hospitality whole, makes it complete. We offer hospitality not because people will always accept it or love it. We offer hospitality gracefully because God commands us to contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality in Romans. We do not offer to receive something in return. We provide hospitality freely and gracefully, just like God's grace. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So you see, real hospitality isn't about having a picture-perfect welcome desk or having fresh-baked donuts and brewed coffee. They are important parts, but what I want to emphasize is that we do not need to change how God created us 
or change the things that we have in order to be good at hospitality. All we have to do is willing to say yes to vulnerability and share our life and blessing with others. We offer hospitality because we have, we have been welcomed by Christ and we are to welcome others in the same way. Ultimately, hospitality is about sharing our lives gracefully. We share our lives with God and with each other, even with those who are different than us. And we do this because God shares God's life with us throughout our worship and fellowship and ministry and missions, we experience God's hospitality. True hospitality comes from being willing to get vulnerable and kindly, generously give of our time, gifts, space, and story. Real hospitality is saying yes to the opportunities that God sent us our way to step into blessings, whether we are on the giving or receiving ends of hospitality. God gathers us here. God invites us to worship. God speaks to us to bless us with God's presence. And God shares a meal with us in the bread and the cup, which symbolize Christ's sharing of his life with us. It is in sharing of our lives with God and with each other, this mutual hospitality of gracefully giving and gratefully receiving. In this radical hospitality, we partake in God's way of life, in God's mission to reconciling the world, and in God's inclusiveness of all peoples. Amen.